creating a company and then being able to afford to put other people to work, you know, in the same company. So that to me is, is a neat feeling to be able to provide a, uh, a lifestyle, a living. Welcome to Biz Stories Shared, where storytellers share their inspiration, motivation, some disappointments, and how they applied the lessons that led them to success. Stories are gifts. Listen as these gifts are shared. Now, here is your host, Charlotte Plott. Hello, storytellers. This is Charlotte Plott, and I am thrilled to bring you Michael Peters today. Michael, are you ready to be a storyteller? I certainly am, Charlotte. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm happy to have you here, too. So I'm going to tell our listeners a little bit about you. Michael Peters is the CEO of the global cybersecurity firm Lazarus Alliance, which is based in Phoenix, Arizona. Lazarus Alliance's primary purpose is to help organizations attain, maintain, and demonstrate compliance and information security excellence in any jurisdiction. Lazarus Alliance specializes in IT security, risk, privacy, governance, cyberspace law, and compliance leadership solutions, and is fully dedicated to global security in these disciplines. Michael, I've given our listeners just a little summary about you, so will you take a minute, tell us more about you personally, because we want to get to know you better, and then give us an overview of your business. Certainly. I guess from a, just a, a company standpoint, Lazarus Alliance has been in business since uh, the year 2000. That's when we first incorporated. And our clientele, they're various sizes all over the world. I really got into this field. Uh, it was kind of interesting. I'm the type of personality. I don't, uh, I don't sit, sit still very well. And uh, my mind's always uh, buzzing with you know, ways of solving problems and seeing things from different angles and, and just the dynamic uh, nature of information security, I found is, is very appealing and compatible with my, my personal, you know, my personality. I made a uh, decision, you know, a number of years ago to pursue security and, and I've come up through the technological trenches. Uh, gosh, it's been in excess of 25, 30 years already, which is kind of weird, weird to hear me <laughs> say that. But uh, I guess I've been around the block now uh, a few times. Anyways, it's something that I really enjoy. I've got a couple of, uh, I guess, quotes that come to my mind. Uh, one is from a, a, a favorite uh, media person by the name of Marshall McLuhan that, uh, that uh, I've carried around for a long time. And he said, uh, the future masters of technology must be lighthearted and intelligent, and the machine easily masters the grim and the dumb. And <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you know, it, it, some parts of that maybe sound uh, a little harsh, but, you know, to me, it speaks to, uh, you know, being open-minded, to being agile, uh, intellectually agile, um, and, you know, the fact that, there, there is so much to experience in this, in this world, in this life. So uh, I don't know. I just find that really appealing. I have another quote. You know, it's, it's one that I coined about 20 years ago. Um, it also maybe sounds a little bit rough, uh, you know, to somebody that first hears it. But it's, I will bludgeon my way to victory, which sounds, sounds maybe like, you know, I'm putting on some armor or something like that, getting ready for battle. But it was really just a description of my personal tenacity and perseverance to achieve, uh, you know, to achieve goals. And, and that's, you know, I've, I've, I've tried to maintain that, you know, during my, during my life in general. I like those quotes. When you were first describing yourself about being tenacious and you don't sit still very long and you've got all these ideas going, I think that's a pretty good description of an entrepreneur, don't you? I agree with that, certainly. Good. All right. Well, Michael, you've shared many facets of your life, being in business and helping others. And along the way, you maybe had some failures. 
So I want to ask you to tell us of one of the times that you just didn't get the results that you set out to achieve. You failed. Tell us that story. And most importantly, the lessons that you learned. You know, reality is is simply that, um, you know, in the long, along the way, uh, you know, we encounter challenges or obstacles or, you know, gee, I wish I had done something differently in retrospect. Um, so sure, I, uh, I, I usually keep those uh, well guarded, uh, you know, <laughs> as much as possible. Never let them see you sweat. <laughs> well, that's okay. You yeah. don't. You don't have to let us see you sweat. <laughs> so, anyways, there there's a particular occasion that uh, that comes to mind, and and actually, I can just because I've experienced uh, similar things with a, a variety of different companies. I think what I can do is safely keep the keep the innocent unnamed to even the not so innocent uh you know i can keep them a bit anonymous at the moment uh, and sort of generalize on uh you know what it is that i'm thinking of but you know i've spent uh many years as a corporate chief information security officer okay and one of the big challenges uh in this particular or in that particular uh executive level career field really comes in um, from a traditional standpoint, uh, the way that position is structured or placed within an organization. And very traditionally, that position reports up through the technology department, uh, typically reporting to like a chief information officer. It's a terrible place to be because information security is essentially an enforcement. You know, we're essentially like corporate police officers in a way. We're enforcers of rules and regulations. We conduct audits and, you know, we look for people doing bad things, okay. you know, inside and outside the company. And we're all about eliminating risk from an organization. So our our big focus is, is on finding finding negative and bad things. Well, you know, unfortunately, what I have come to realize is that um, a healthy majority of uh, organizations, there's there's bad apples in every bunch. Mm. So depending on, you know, uh, what those situations look like, I mean, I've encountered just flat out criminal acts. To give you an example, uh, in 2009, I can I can use this as an example because they're out of business now. Okay. But, uh, I was the CISO for Colonial Bank, which was a uh, you know a huge multinational uh, bank, um, and uh, I basically I uncovered uh, mortgage fraud to the tune of just shy of three billion dollars. Oh. So they became the largest bank failure of 2009. And the reason was because I found, you know, a second set of books, me and my, uh, you know, the team that I had trained in forensics and investigations and whatnot, um, you know, we found this massive fraud and the FDIC came in and, and seized the company and people went to jail and people, you know, uh, were fined and, and all kinds of things. And in the process of doing my job, of course, me and everyone else, we lost our jobs. Oh, no. Well, oh. that's what happened. <laughs> that doesn't seem fair. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I guess even though, yeah, it doesn't seem fair. And even though it was difficult for me and everyone else, um, you know, and it, it things like that, it, situations like that, they put you into really difficult ethical positions. But you know, I'm just the kind of person that, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the right thing. Uh, you know, I have plenty of certifications and ethu or ethical uh, boundaries that I have to operate within and just, you know, just simple right and wrong. I'm gonna do the right thing. And so that frequently puts me at odd with people who are not so interested in doing the right thing. From a, you know, if I had to say failure, success, something like that, if I 
take away from those experiences, and there's several, unfortunately. Uh, it's uh, documentation is your friend. Keeping multiple copies of evidence and documentation away from, you know, the the, the grips of uh, of you know these people who uh, are doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And it's purely just to protect yourself and as well as preserve evidence. I'm a pretty quick study, so uh, that, you know, that really only happened once. And every, every subsequent time, uh, you better believe I was, uh, I had those bases well covered. Thank you for sharing that, Michael. And, and I wouldn't say that that's a failure on, on your part. It, you did what was right and suffered the consequences of it. And it's a good, it was a good lesson. And you learned what you need to do to protect yourself and your company in the future. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I know sometimes it's hard to go back and relive those times. However, you gave us a very good example of your ethics and your boundaries and what you do to be an honest citizen and businessman. So good for you. Thanks. Thank you. What I want to do now, Michael, is to go to the other end of the spectrum. And let's talk about a time in your journey when you had an aha moment when you became aware of the new path that you wanted to travel. So take us to that moment when the light bulb went off and take us through the steps that you took to turn that idea into success. That's actually kind of an easy one. So basically drawing on uh, that negative experience that I just, just shared with you, you know, the gears started, started turning. It's, it's like, okay, since everybody... You know, all, all companies need very similar cybersecurity coverage, uh, right. processes, the, the things involved. There's so many similarities. You know, it's, it's really just size and scope of an organization that it just adds volume, essentially. But a lot of the fundamentals are identical no matter what the size company. So thinking about that sort of thing, and I've created a, a number of, you know, you know innovations along the way, you know, for various reasons. But a, a very common theme is taking something that's very complex uh, and making it more accessible to a larger audience, organizing a lot of the, the chaos, you know, the confusion surrounding some of these complex uh, activities like audit, like governance, like cybersecurity, and, you know, those related disciplines setting about doing the things that are required in a proactive sort of a, a sense versus a reactive sense or a, at the last minute. And I was, I was, I was consulting with a, a company even before I experienced, um, you know, the, the, the colonial bank meltdown right. that period. I was working with a, a large healthcare organization and they had just about every type of audit facing them. They had PCI and they had HIPAA and the Department of Insurance and so on and so forth. And one of the crazy things that I thought was, you know, the way we were required to conduct these types of assessments, we would focus on one at a time. So we would go in and ask people, you know, within the organization to produce evidence and responses and things, only looking at one, you know, one of these audit or compliance uh, re requirement standards at a time. So, you know, let's say Q1 of the year, we're working on one of them, and then we flip over to Q2, and then we're working on another one. Well, we're duplicating a lot of effort. We're irritating people who are like, hey, I gave you this information last quarter. Right. It's very inefficient. What I ended up creating was what today is known as the HORSE Project, and which that's an acronym for the Holistic Operational Readiness Security Evaluation. Wow. It's the HORSE Project. I might add it has uh, been out in, in production for nine years now. <gasps> really? Wow. <laughs> it's funny. I... Uh, I had this idea to do a consolidated audit to basically ask the questions once. Once. Uh, you know, with a comprehensive framework so that I could work more efficiency. So what was sort of funny about that situation was here I am a consultant and the more billable time that I get, <laughs> right. 
I am creating efficiencies to reduce my time. <laughs> Maybe I should hire a CFO to uh, to manage my time or something instead of giving it away all the time. But no, I think that really speaks well of you, Michael, because in the way that you described how doing the same questions over and over was such a waste of time, and you had the ingenuity and the dedication and the integrity to go in and redo that system and come up with the horse. I don't remember what those words were. Would you say it again? Holistic Operational Readiness Security Evaluation. I think that is great. So. Good for you, and that's why you're such a success, when you can help other people and still maintain your company in a viable position, too. And and like I say, your integrity is such a big part of that. So good for you. That's, that's really wonderful to hear. Thank you for sharing that. Well, sometimes those real-life experiences, like the one where you create such a good uh, process that it cuts down on your billable time, but you've taken all those lessons and now you can apply them to other facets of your life and your business, and that's how you keep growing. So I'm going to ask you to bring us to the present time and share your proudest entrepreneurial moment. Well, yeah, that's that's not tough. Um, really, it amounts to putting putting other people to work. Oh, creating a company, and then being able to afford to put other people to work, you know, in the same company. So that, to me, is is a neat feeling to be able to provide a, uh, a lifestyle, a living, you know. Obviously, they have to work hard. And sure. They have a, a really demanding boss, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, that's a... Uh, I think that's a, it's a good feeling that's there's a reward in in hard work and good decisions when you can you know uh, culture your business and start employing other people you know with uh, the same mission the same goals and continue growing from there so we've uh, we've been on a nice uh, nice trajectory and um, for for many years. I, it was really a sole proprietor type of uh, an arrangement. I, I was plenty busy and mm -hmm. I made a nice living and stuff, but it was just, there's, I, I just see so much to do, so many different things that we can, you know, I can be helpful, but I can't be everywhere, you know, and I like making a difference in people's lives or, you know, and I say that by extension, you know, their companies, their, sure. you know, their business making a tangible difference and you know the one of the other things i've learned along the way is i can't do everything myself right i'm not the master of all domains um and so you know i uh, i depend on you know my team members other people to uh to help me achieve you know both personal goals and business goals which by extension are personal goals you know it's exciting to uh you know, to be working with other professionals, you know, in, in an area that I'm, you know, that I love, that I'm passionate about and feel like, you know, yeah, we, we really do make a big difference. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of satisfactions derived from that. I can see that there would be so much satisfaction. And to me, when I think about what had to be involved from going from a sole proprietor to a company that has employees that had to be a challenging task because you had to know that you were going to be able to have the business for all those people to earn an income that was satisfactory to you and to the employees. And so I think that, to me, it just sounds like a, a very challenging part of devising a new business. You know, it's a transition point that, uh, you know, I, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't scary at all. Sure. You know, it's, uh, you know, you have to, you have to make the leap. You have to, you know, you try to be as smart as you can be and try to make, you know, the best decisions that you can be. Um, you know, and I've, I've bootstrapped this business from, from the ground up. You know, we've, you know, I've hired different people, you know, to achieve certain goals. Um, 
you know, we have a few foundational type goals that from a company standpoint that we felt when I say we, it's, you know, it's, it's really me for the most part, but sure. now that I bring on other people, then, you know, then, uh, then they, you know, there's input there, but, but there were a few things that I really wanted to achieve in order to, uh, I guess you could say differentiate what we do from, from other firms. Um, and part of that involves intellectual property. Uh, okay. you know, you know, we do various things as an organization, you know, we're, uh, we're a QSA, which, you know, we're a certification body for things like PCI audits or SSA 16 or FedRAMP or whatnot. There's a variety of, of certifications and, and, and audits that we, you know, we're certified to perform and that doesn't make us different from our competitors. If, uh, you know, meet the, you know, the same basic requirements to be able to do things like that. But what really differentiates us and is something that, you know, I really put a lot of focus into over the years are creating things like the horse project. Mm -hmm. You know, a, another example of, of this would be, it's basically the next generation of the horse project is what it amounts to Oh, product that uh, we recently released. It's a software, uh, you know, cloud-based type of an application um, that we've been using internally for quite some time, but now we've made it available to our clients and, you know, even, you know, folks on the outside, but it's called the IT audit machine or auditmachine.com is, is where it's at. But but it's really the mechanized version of the the horse project, so it's it's really grown up, and uh, you know I believe it's a a significant differentiator for us because it helps us to be more efficient and reduce costs, uh, you know make these complex things much more accessible to our clientele. It increases our uh, collaboration and it allows us to apply our proactive cybersecurity methodology. Um, as opposed to the traditional, uh, you know, audit fire drills or the audit anarchy that's associated with these same tasks where companies come in and bear you in spreadsheets, right. you know, they're, uh, the, these things are done at the last minute. So, you know, you know, you know, we already have our day jobs, but now the auditors are going to load up, uh, you know, load us up for weeks. So right. we just, I just, to me, that's just you know, the definition of insanity. So we, uh, I think we've eliminated all of that. Well, that's exciting to hear that you have the next rendition of the horse project. And people really want to hear stories like yours and how you're growing and making your business a success and how your business helps others to thrive. And what a good feeling for those people that they don't aren't going to fear the auditors when you come in because of the extra work and time that they have to spend, because that must have just been a real burden to the employees. So I think that says a lot for you, too, that you took that into consideration of, of how they feel at the end of the day when they have to go through all of those processes. Do you have anything else that's really exciting in your business right now? Well, certainly growth. You know, we we continue to build out some of this intellectual property. We have a nifty cloud-based application called the Policy Machine, which you know allows the individual the ability to answer a relatively simple questionnaire and have a hundred percent of their corporate governance documentation uh, custom created. And it doesn't take very long, and it's very economical. And we uh, we have a lot of happy customers using that tool. Wow. We also use currently for our clientele because you know we have similar engagements. But you know again, it's a tool that we we use, but we you know we offer to our clientele, and you know gives them the flexibility of reducing their costs and and empowers them. You know, we help, you know, our our part is even though this is even though this is a self-driven type of an application, we designed it. Oh. We're providing guidance, right. um, you know, really no cost to them. Um, so it's almost impossible for them to to goof it up. So <laughs> that, that sounds really good. 
Well, Michael, what's the best business advice that you've ever received? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, it probably came uh, during my time in law school. I, yeah, I, I, I did graduate from law school. I, uh, it wasn't to become a lawyer, uh, but it, I work with so many attorneys and oh. it's almost like speaking a different language. So I thought, you know what? I, uh, I'm always up for, you know, learning something new and degrees or whatnot. So, uh, so I thought, yeah, let's, let's go to law school. So I did. <laughs> On and, purpose. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. Law school and security, uh, you know, can I, <laughs> can I add anything else to me that, uh, people don't like? <laughs> uh, so in law school, I learned that in contracts, all things are negotiable. So, so, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, if you're dealing with a service provider, that contract's negotiable, even if they say it's not, or, you know, if you were working with your clients and customers or employees or whatever in contracts, all things are negotiable. So. Wow. Well, that, that's very interesting. Yeah. It's simple, but still complicated. Well, Michael, what is the vision of the future of your business? Well, it's certainly, uh, you know, continuing our, our growth trajectory. I'm happiest when I feel like we've made, you know, the, the largest, most profound type of a difference for, you know, for our clients, you know, for their customers, their employees, shareholders and whatnot. Uh, turning these complex, uh, complex tasks, these complex, you know, processes uh, you know, continuing to make those more accessible. In doing so, we effectively raise the awareness for information security and risk, you know, risk management and whatnot, globally speaking. Um, you know, in doing so, that benefits, you know, the larger audience, uh, more of the company. You know, you, you know, the more you understand, the more you become enlightened sure. about the subject, um, you know, the better decisions you make or... Uh, choices that you make. So I, I definitely think, you know, continuing that, uh, that tradition is, is, uh, of course, going to going to occur. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm a habitual innovator, so I, I can't help myself. <laughs> um, there's always a better way. There's always some... Well, I think that's why you're so successful. Well, we're working on that part. So can you share one of your personal habits that you strongly believe contributes to your success? You know, really structuring my day. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think you can ever be overly organized. If you were to ask, uh, especially my wife, uh, you know, when she first got a hold of me, <laughs> and I was like sticky notes all over the place, and, you know, I was an, I was a wreck. But uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, no, it's really structuring my day. You know, I, I, I get up every day, weekends included. Uh, I'm up about 4 a.m., no alarm clocks required. I don't know. I know that's kind of weird, I suppose, but, you know, it's just a, a biorhythm. It's a, it's a habit. So, I, you know, I start my day quietly collecting my thoughts, uh, you know, the objectives for the day. You know, I try to structure my time and set, set goals. You know, I keep lists, uh, lots of documentation and calendar events and, you know, these, these simple little things that help me to stay focused. And I mean, we have so many distractions, uh, you know, in our day out there, you know, all of which really tend to negatively impact, uh, you know, your personal effectiveness. So it's really up to me to determine what rules my life. So That's I, I true. just, I try to do that. Okay. Well, do you have an internet resource to share with our listeners, which helps your efficiency like Evernote or maybe an app? And storytellers, you will find the links to these sites in the show notes of today's episode as bizstoryshare.com, Michael Peters. So some of these business apps, I'll, I'll probably not name names, even the one that you just named. Actually, as a security practitioner, um, I have a lot of a lot of issues with some of those apps that uh, they're not secure or they're mm -hmm. not data or they've been breached a multitude of times and you know it's a bit of disregard for for their customers' uh, safety and privacy. So 
Um, you know, I do tend to scrutinize these things a bit more than I think the average person does. But, you know, I'd have to say, you know, in my business, uh, security, I mean, there is no downtime. There's no weekends, no holidays. I, I take time off when when I think it's appropriate for, for my life, okay. uh, which is, is kind of nice from the flexibility standpoint of things. But, you know, I, I love always being connected, uh, you know, the connected capabilities that mobile technology brings me. Um, you know, I get to use moments that may be wasted sitting around in waiting rooms or airport terminals, uh, you know, these moments of productive time that used to be wasted. So I love the mobile technology uh, that, that helps me utilize some of those, uh, you know, those moments of downtime. You know, I can always turn it off, but it's certainly nice to have that as an option. Yes, it, it is good to have that option. And sometimes we just do need to unplug, don't we? Michael, if you could recommend just one book for our listeners, what would it be? Well, I tell you, there's one that I am, uh, I'm almost finished with right now. And uh, it's from an author named Daniel Pink. Mm. And the book title is To Sell is Human. And the reason I was interested in this book is I don't, I, I don't really consider myself to be like a salesperson. But the funny thing is, uh, when I'm reading this, this book, we, we all basically do some form of this all of the time. And, you know, in a way, uh, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about what I do. I love to talk about it. I'm here with you right now. Yes. So in a way I'm selling. So uh, <laughs> uh, it was a funny little nugget I've uh, pulled out from Daniel Pink's book. Well, thank you. And I'll put that in the show notes also. Michael, I have truly enjoyed listening to your journey and the stories that you shared. So will you tell us one more time how we can get in touch with you and any other resources that you want us to have, and then we'll say goodbye. Okay. Well, I'm super easy to find, uh, certainly through LazarusAlliance.com. That's uh, my company's website. You can find me on LinkedIn easy enough, and I, uh, I guarantee I'll connect with you. Good. So I'm easy to find there. You know, I'm, uh, I'm on Twitter, Google+, Facebook. So I'm, I'm pretty easy to track down. My personal website is michaelpeters.org. That's my blog. Love to connect with people. And it's been a pleasure spending time with you this morning, Charlotte. Well, thank you. It's been very informative for me, too. And so thank you for being so generous with your time and expertise and experiences. So thank you again, Michael. Goodbye. Goodbye. Give the storyteller some love. Go to bizstoryshared.com, click on the iTunes button, and give a five-star review. Thanks.